My question relates to physical pain in the process of discovering my power. If there is a transformative role in inviting pain, because sitting is, is cause pain, physical pain. I don't see any transformation in inviting physical pain. Enduring it is different. When you invite it, you can become a masochist. Don't do that. Okay. When you endure it, then you realize what your mind does. It can become very strong, but also very hurt and very traumatized. The Buddha says, mutilating or torturing the body never gets you any enlightenment. He had to say that because the Hindu ascetics, they regularly cut off some fingers, uh, some other parts of the body, so that their pain would get them closer to God because it kills their ego, things like that. No, it didn't do that. So I suggest that you transform your intention from physical pain to perceiving your karma. So make your peace with your own body. Use a chair, beach ball, do yoga. Don't make yourself suffer physically. Why? Because this body is not the objective. Your mind is the objective. This body, when you die, goes to the cemetery. Cremated or in a coffin or in any other way, you lose it. Keep it healthy in a way that you could finish your incarnation. But this body will not help you. You can use it. But whatever happens to this body is important for only one reason. It's a gateway to your soul, to your mind. So focus on the mind and then you will feel a very, very different kind of pain. Mental pain. Much harder to endure than physical. You will feel, that's me. I carry this karma. I identify with these emotions. I identify with these thoughts. I did this, I hurt other people. I violated their freedom, their integrity, their respect. That's mental pain. Very different from just a sense of guilt. Sense of guilt is very small, usually religiously exploited. That's why those people who are on a guilt trip, they cannot get enlightenment. But when you perceive real cause and effect, you have to get to the point when you see that this was created by your mind. So when the creator, your mind, and the karma that you created are both seen as empty, that is termed the true repentance. So people can repent for their mistakes in many ways. But when you perceive that this is created by ourselves, and you cannot blame anyone else, that's real pain. And when you stop that creation, and you do not make that karma anymore, that's liberation. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Other question? So, uh, you were talking about Zen, um, like you are comparing a human being with a tree. Like no. a tree never says, no. I did not compare a human being to a tree. Okay. I said how a tree operates, and I also said how a human being operates. Okay. So I ask you, a tree and a human, are they the same or are they different? Good question. <laughs> how would you answer? <laughs> Only that? <laughs> it, it appeared to me when you talked, maybe it's um, not hearing good, but um, that I have to uh, get rid of anything human of me if I want to get enlightened or to um, no. to renew my karma. That's a misunderstanding. Okay, so could you please um, make it cl clarify for me? Have you ever climbed a mountain with a backpack? Um, yes. Good. When you put down your backpack to rest, did it make the mountain disappear? No. Good. So, so when you rested enough, when you selected what you need in your backpack and what you don't, you put that backpack back onto yourself and you continued climbing. But the person who started the climb and the person who finished the climb 
they were not the same. That's sure. why we go up to the mountain. That's why we go to nature because instinctively we want to change. We want to attain this natural oneness again. So I can deliberate, cho choose my thoughts or choose my um, action. Th that's what you mean? If you like, you can do that. Okay. But that's not what I meant. What I meant is always perceive your situation, your relationship, and the correct function. That dictates your thoughts, emotions, your speech, and your actions. Not your thinking defines your thinking. Okay. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Compassion. I came from the land, Israel, where there is an enemy. We call it an enemy. How can, as a practitioner, bring compassion to the enemy? Don't make enemy. If you don't make enemy, compassion naturally appears. But if you make enemy, you cannot be compassionate to your enemy because you would feel weak. As long as you have an enemy, you're a fighter. The moment you stop making enemies, compassion naturally appears. I'll give you an example. If you look at a human being, you can perceive many things. But Sung San Salim said, if you're not attached to thinking, your mind, my mind can become one. If you're attached to thinking, your mind, my mind are separate. If you're attached to people's religious identity, nationality, the language they speak, the history they have, the opinion they have on you, enemy can easily appear. Easily. But if you can go beyond that, then your Buddha nature, my Buddha nature, the Sunni Buddha nature, the Shia Buddha nature, the Hasidic Buddha nature, the Ashkenazi Buddha nature, the Sephardim Buddha nature, same Buddha nature. But if you're attached to religion, we all die. Attached to nationality, we all fight. Attached to any idea of God, we all go to hell. That's why we practice. Maybe I'm hell, in hell. No, you're in the best place on earth. <laughs> Look at this. Well, I, I actually, I will say, I killed in war. So what I do? You repent. You didn't murder anybody. You were a soldier. It's very different. Like you can purchase goods in many ways. You can take life in many ways. And that kind of killing was killing in action. It's KIA. I'm not absolving soldiers from their duties or their actions. What I mean is, you didn't do it for yourself. It wasn't personal, but it also means that you took life. In order not to go to hell, you have to repent. You have to say deeply, I'm sorry that I had to do this. I defended my country. If not, we are forever in the realm of post-traumatic stress, and then our mind goes to hell. We are all together, whether we love each other or hate each other, whether we give birth or take life, that's very strong bond. Taking life is almost as strong a bond as giving birth. But one plus and the other is minus. Okay? I give you an example. In the Balkan War in 1992 or 3, an F-117 Nighthawk was shot down by a Serbian radar that was operated by a Hungarian officer. They used old Russian radar frequencies and the stealth bomber was not designed to evade that. So he was visible on the radar, like a beam of light. He got shot. It was the big surprise that the invincible Nighthawk just boom, got shot out of the sky. Well, the pilot was well trained. He blipped the radio once so that uh, the US would know that he's alive and then total radio silence. He was hiding for two weeks. 
then he figured that he was at the end of his reserves and they must have organized his rescue. He just radioed one more time. Very short time. And they triangulated his location, they rescued him from the mountains, he got home safe. And jump about 17 years, and the documentary was published that he went back to Serbia. He found the radar operator. And the operator and his family also visited him in the United States, and they became friends. True story. So by shooting at each other, we make together karma. Okay? Later, that can become friendly or totally annihilating each other. But actually, fighting is very intimate. It's very close. So be careful who you shot at, because you will either have to love them or kill them later. This karma appears. So that's why repentance is so important, because it clears that karma, the closeness remains. You'll meet them next lifetime. Well, I have to do something, yeah. Yeah. Lots of bows, lots of chanting, and sometimes a cleansing ceremony, karma cleansing ceremony. When you clear your mind of all this, that's my past, I don't identify with this, I'm sorry for everything that I have done. I'm sorry for all those people that I hurt or killed. That is the soldier's job, big job. Okay? Thank you very much. You're welcome. My question is about the fear of letting go. Um, sometimes I feel like... Uh, um, okay. I, I won't, I, I can't, I won't be able to stand letting go of my children or something will happen to them. Okay, children are very complex. So <laughs> yeah. let's leave them for a while. As and much as we love if, them, if we have the to situation. use uh, more simple examples. So one is, again, climbing a mountain. When you hang on the rope and six more people hang on the same rope, you don't let go. You use the rope, all right? When you pick up the trash near your house because somebody was ignorant and negligent, it's not difficult to let go of the trash when you actually see a trash can. You don't look at this used paper and say, should I let go of this piece of trash or will it hurt me? Okay, so naturally you throw it to the right place. When children gain their autonomy, they have to go, whether you let them or not. So you either have a choice of being harmonious and see them grow and then you get some quiet at home. Then they will come back with gratitude in their hearts because oh, our mother was so compassionate. Too early, they feel you threw them at the street, okay? <laughs> Too late, they are in mom's hotel. In Hungarian psychological terms, there's a saying, the child became an adult in mom's hotel. <laughs> that means too strong grip. That means they never became adults. I had a visitor, 37 years old, men. His mother brought him here. He used to live at home, browsing the internet all day, no jobs, no obligations, no girlfriend, but also no life. Mother pampered him for 37 years. And I said, what do you want? Your mother brought you here. Do you have your own words? Do you have your own actions? I want to move into the temple. And the mother was going like this <laughs> next to him. Said, Good golly. So I said, Okay, you can move in. I have three conditions. Move out of home, get your own rental or apartment, get a job, and get a girlfriend. Once you've done that, and you still want to move in, you're welcome. He never appeared. <laughs> he got stuck with the job. He wrote to me, I already got a job, but I got kicked out after two weeks. I said, go back. <laughs> Go back to your job. 
So uh, gaining independence is harder than you think. So that's why mother and father, they have to be in a close agreement or in a remote agreement, depending on your life situation. And this is the time that our children are mature enough that we could let go of them. But that means they return with gratitude in their hearts and not banging at the door. Mama, I'm already 24. Don't you notice? Come on, sweetie, go do your life. Follow your way and don't complain to me. OK, go. Thank you. But but I, I was delicate when when I said letting go. I was also delicate. Trust yeah, me. but I'm <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, if like uh, I mean about death. Death? Yeah, of a child. Uh, death is different. Letting go means you let them go. But when they die, that means you have to say your final goodbye. Farewell. Did you have to do that? Say a final goodbye to any of your children? Um, it is something that is in the air. It is not, uh, yeah, uh, nearly. It's very different. My mother died three days ago. You cannot prepare for that. But you can prepare yourself uh, together with her. So, The first and most important act is that I thanked her as many times as possible, deeply, from the bottom of my heart, why she could understand what I was saying. And I was fortunate enough that I could do that. Now, you don't do that to a child because it's in the air. Only you know what that means to you. I don't want to elaborate on that. I just caution you, don't to make anything. See cause and effect. Each of us has their own path. If you see that it leads towards a premature death, then be very careful. Help them. Help him or her. But it's more natural that we die first and our children say their goodbyes and their thanks and their repentance to the parents or grandparents. And letting go is almost impossible to imagine before you have to do that. What you can do and what all of us should do is keep this unmoving mind, this very clear unmoving mind and not suppress your thoughts, not follow your thoughts, not suppress your feelings, not follow your feelings. My wife said, I know you, but you don't seem to be so traumatized by the last three days. I said, no, I was traumatized by the last two years. That's why you don't see it. I'm already used to it that the mother I used to know is gone, although she was still in her body. But the way her mind functioned well, meant that I was gradually losing her every day, a little less and less of the mother that she used to be. And I had to come to terms with every single day when I visited her, that I might find her dead. Now that was in the air. But I didn't presume. I didn't make. I just had this question, do I find her alive or dead? And those people who helped, they had the same. The same eyes, the same concerns, the, the same compassion. And when finally she was gone, then the transition was not something shocking. Why? Because I never denied it. I never wanted to refute reality. I faced reality every day, every moment, and that's what we should do. And death is just a transition, not a shock. And we can endure that because we face reality every single moment. And that makes us stronger. But it doesn't take the feeling away. Why it doesn't appear in me? Because I don't touch it. I let it go through me. It's a special vibration. And you see sunset. And there's a moment of, of sadness in the air 
but nothing happens. You just see a certain color, a certain atmosphere, a little stillness, and you know that you have one day less of your life than yesterday. And that's very natural. Our tears are natural. Our sadness is natural. So if we deny it, it's a shock. Then it's very hard to let go. But if you let go every day, then this transition is, is just what it is. And it goes through you because you go through it. When somebody close to you dies, then endure the feeling that you also die inside. But you stay in the body and you come out of the grave. But if you really loved someone, at least for a short time, your heart is completely going to the grave, to the other side with her or him. And that's also okay. But at that time you have to realize we are alive. She's gone. I have a job here. She finished hers in this body and left it behind. And she has to move on. Then we do ceremony. Then we say our final goodbyes. And that's life on this earth. Many people talk about the fear of death. We don't know what death is before we face it ourselves. But many of us are afraid of life. So if you're not afraid of impermanence, imperfection, and interdependence, you're not afraid of life. So let's live this life with a complete view, a complete experience that eventually we all die. Nobody stays. And if you live long enough, you don't want to. You don't want to finish earlier. You don't want to go earlier. And you don't want to stay too long. You realize that your natural span of life is just enough. Not too much, not too little. Then it's not difficult to let go. Okay? Thank you very much. You're In welcome. the meantime, I just don't know. I just let it, Fantastic. Let it be. Thank very you good. very much. Excellent. You're welcome. I want to ask about compassion. Um, sometimes when I help people and uh, I feel that like, uh, how do you say, despair, that things that I can't, that I can't help or that it's, it's too hard for me and I have myself too much and I don't let the other, peop the other person, uh, I don't hear them, I get despaired, that's, that's what, for minutes. And I, I can't sometimes keep my compassion. Why do you despair? There are 7.9 billion human beings on this planet and you're one of them. If you need help, ask for help. If it's totally your job, then do it. But you cannot do everything. Do your job. Don't do other people's job. You have two hands, two legs, one head, that's enough. As much as you can do with one heart and one body, do that much. You don't have two bodies. You don't have multiple minds. You don't have control over the whole earth. And it's very good that way. So do what you can and don't do what you cannot. And that's a sense of enough. I have done enough. I, I wasn't lazy. And I wasn't over ambitious. That's why the middle way is such a great treasure. Keep that. When your mind is clear, you can keep the middle way. Life is a marathon, not just a sprint. Sometimes we have fast laps. Sometimes we have intense periods. But life is a marathon. Don't use up all your energy. When you're emotionally exhausted, you can get despaired. That means... You need some emotional food. You need some more resources. 
Compassion is very energy hungry. Patience is one of the most demanding things on earth. So you're on the right track. Keep chanting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to ask about uh, courage. Get more courage. Do I thought I'm a very courageous person, but to jump out of a cliff to the sea, I was the first one to do that, but have the opportunity to let go of my habits that cause me and others suffering and just do it. I feel it's hard for me. In order to get great courage, you have to have two companions. One is great question, the other is great faith. If you don't have great question, you do not take away your own karma. Because you never ask. You never detach. You never perceive. You will always identify. Mm -hmm. Those people who have very narrow minds and they always identify with their views, they seem to be very courageous until conflict breaks them. Mm -hmm. Those people who do not have such a strong ego, but they have this great question, what is this? What am I? Based on their experience, they can develop a faith which is not based on any ego. That faith is unbreakable. It's our experience of this. When you have this mind firmly 24-7, you can only be destroyed but not defeated. And that's the source of great courage then we no longer look for external proof, any kind of uh, objective criteria that that's what makes me courageous and that's what makes me a coward. Can you face this moment or do you run or do you fight? Can you face your relationship or you always feel inferior or superior? Can you cooperate can you do together action without thinking about yourself or the other? Without checking, without making, without wanting, holding. That's great courage. So if you have great question and you can develop great faith, that's the true source of great courage. Don't look anywhere else. You'll find it there. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. My father... Um both his parents have uh, dementia. Um, and my grandmother, she, do she doesn't remember me or him. Um, and she's plugged to machines and she's, she's not there at, at all. And he's not happy with, with his job. And I'm not even sure if, if he loves my mom. And he seems like he suffers a lot. And I, c I don't know how to help him. You cannot directly help this kind of karma. My mother had dementia. As much as we could help her, we did, but it didn't stop the decline, only made it more compassionate and smoother. You are the master of your own body and your own soul. It's not selfish to take care of that first and next, help other beings. But if you don't help other beings, you cannot become free from your own personal karmic burden. And you can only help other people if you became clear who you truly are. There's a strong correspondence between the two, helping others and helping yourself. And when you have this kind of family, that is the greatest pain to see and feel. As much as you love them and help them, you cannot change their karma. I couldn't change my mother's karma. I offered her this kind of practice multiple times. But you cannot force your parents to do something you believe in. I came back from Korea. She was lucid and clear. In fact, she was lucid and clear until like five, six years ago. And she said by herself, you know, can I see what you're doing? Can I go to your chanting to this college and uh, see all the Buddhists? Yes, mom, I'll take you by car. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll just go with Mrs. Kato, you know, Kato Nini. And they came together. They chit-chatted. They came for chanting. At home, I said, mom, how was it? 
said, son, I love you very much, but would you mind if I don't do this anymore? He said, no, mom. You were just curious, and if you don't like it, you don't have to do it. But if you don't do something with your own mind, then your experiences can be overwhelming. It can cause your mind to crack or dysfunction in so many other ways. Sometimes we make this tragic mistake that we want to solve other people's problems before solving ours. It's not selfish to turn inside. Because out of that comes the way out. Yes, it is painful to see that you cannot change even the closest person's karma to you. Especially those who are close to you. It's a brutal equation. Just like we don't teach English successfully to our parents. I couldn't teach the Dharma to any of them. Although they saw Zen Master Sung San in 1997 in Korea. One of the happiest days of my life. But my father went down after 97, summer. My mom went up. And even that wasn't enough for her. She spent the last two years here, but the last month. And it was still not enough. I didn't push, I didn't force. I only demonstrated that I'm willing to help her. But she rather took me as her son and not as a teacher. And I stopped blaming myself for that. I stopped feeling bad about it, even, even though I saw her mental decline, which could have been stopped. But when she suffered, she started to listen to me, but only when I said, Mom, we should really switch off your television. Then you may not imagine that those people in the screen are actually in your room. Then these narratives stopped after a month. But then worse narratives came, worse visions came. And that was not dependent on television anymore. It was dependent on her past, on her mind. How strong or weak you are towards your own illusions. And when the mind is weak, it believes its own illusions. So make your mind strong and clear so that you would never believe illusions as reality. That's number one, especially when People close to you have dementia. And this is why I feel grateful for this practice, for my teachers and everything, everything that I could do and can keep doing. And just like I answered the, the previous question about despair, in this way we have to recognize our own boundaries. These boundaries are not limits. I don't feel limited. I feel that that's where a human being begins and that's where it ends. We are not omnipotent. We are not infinite. We are not living forever. We are not perfect. And once we became clear about that, strangely enough, we find our own way. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. The Heart Sutra says, Without hindrances, no fear exists. So my question is, what exactly is hindrances? What did you do to come here? A lot of effort. Yeah. Why did you have to make effort? Because it wasn't easy. That's why. When you don't trust, you don't believe that you can fulfill these efforts, that means the hindrances are bigger than you. At least in your mind, that's fear. By default, we humans have many false ideas about ourselves. We believe we are like this, we are not like that. And when we believe in these ideas, they become a hindrance because we don't believe we can be wise. We don't believe we can be selfless. We don't believe we can help other people. And once you make that as an absolute reality for yourself, it becomes a hindrance and then you're afraid. You're afraid it may not be true. So mental hindrance is false identity, greed, anger, ignorance.
read the old Torah scripture. God says, do not make a painted or carved image instead of me or before me. So before your true nature, do not identify with any idols of name and form. It's a liberal translation. If it's wrong, I go to hell, but you'll help me get out. Okay? So if you entertain false images and false identities, you lose sight of your true nature. You lose the experience of who you truly are. That's the biggest hindrance. Everything else is smaller and comes out of this major mistake to confuse your self-image with your true self. And that's why we are here, to dissolve all these false illusions, to discard all this self-image and become simple and clear. And the simple and clear is selfless. Then no hindrance, no fear. Thank you very much for practicing together and I sincerely appreciate all the effort you have made to come here, join the Sangha and support the temple in our endeavor to wake up and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.